Hello. Sorry, getting muddled over mics. Good morning. Get it right this morning. The darkness doesn't help, does it? But good morning. It's lovely to see you all. We send out our love to those who are not with us today, to Jenny um, Ainsworth, who is obviously going through treatment right now. We send her our love, and uh, we're with her every step of the way. Um, that song we've just sung was a choice that uh, Beth uh, she asked if we would sing it. I think we all relate, don't we, in some way to the words of that song, that suddenly the surface cracks and it reveals the tracks and the, the path we, we end up on. We think, I, I, if I'd have chosen, I wouldn't have chosen this. But we end up in a new world and we have to navigate it and we've got to figure it out as we go. Now, this week, uh, we're doing a bit of a, a collaboration as we do probably once a month and that's why... Beth uh, chose that song. I want to just say how uh, very thrilled I am, and I know you, you will uh, agree with me. The ministry that we get is fantastic, and we just, you know, there's not a week goes by, and if you think about it, half an hour, that's probably it for the week, half an hour, but you get some incredible uh, meat, vegetables, salad, gravy, the whole and a pudding, but you know what I mean, it's, it's, it's soul food, so we, we want to say thank you. And so this morning, what's going to be reflected is the application, hopefully, uh, of people here, some of the people who um, want to say what they believe that they've gleaned from some of the things. So from Halloween through to last week, um, you're going to be listening to some people's views of how they've applied those things to their lives. Actually, I'm, I'm glad that Bruce and Christine and Francine have just walked in because I just wanted to say we welcome them into the family. It's great that you're with us. And if you don't know who they are, go and introduce them, uh, yourselves to them. Um, they, they are awesome people and they've chosen to come over here from the other side, Lancashire, over here to be part of this family, and that's really great. And we, we, we know that they're going to add some, uh, what's the word, value to, to our, our home here. So we welcome you. I'm glad you've, you, you've, you've come and joined us this morning. So we're going to, um, Dave Craven is going to start out tonight, which is wonderful. And, um, but before he comes to speak, um, watch this, okay? Good morning, everybody. I was going to say uh, you ladies would know what that means, but actually, guys do the washing now as well. You know what I mean? You can't just say that. But that you've just witnessed um, a centrifugal force gone wrong. Uh, like we saw last week uh, when Amph brought the message about the hamsters and the uh, clip with James May in the centrifuge, um, my memories went back to my engineering days because... Um, we had a massive machine which was called D. Smith and Grace and it had a, I'm going to say a four foot faceplate but it's actually a 1.2 meter for you young people. 1.2 meter diameter and we used to put large castings on it, all kinds of shapes and bore holes in them. But the problem was if you had a casting that was say, you know, this big and you had to put a hole offset then you had to balance the casting. So you used to clamp it to the machine and you used to flick the machine in neutral and spin it round. Obviously, the weight all went to the bottom, always. So we had to clamp other weights on the machine so that when you turned it on, it didn't shake itself to bits. Like the washing machine, the forces on a centrifuge is Im immense and it would literally shake the whole machine to pieces. Now, when Anth brought last week about um, the centrifuge, it made me realize that in the world where we live, it's always spinning. Life is always spinning. And the thing is, the closer we get to the center, the less effect forces have on us. And um, when you look at, when you do an RPA, revs per minute, at the peripheral of any circle, the speed is so immense compared with the speed in the middle. So my encouragement to you today is to be more central, be more centered, 
Um, don't look on the outside. It's all central. It's all drawing in to who you are and to what you, how you look at things. See, in life there's winter, summer. There's good, bad. That's happening all the time. So the, the thing is spinning and it's all in balance. I mean, we've heard a lot about how we've messed the planet up and how things are getting out of balance. Well, it's the same thing. Balance is very important. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, when Ruth brought the I am scenario, made me realize, and that's what triggered this off, that if you say your name, full name, then you say your, your first name, and then you say just I am, you know, I am Dave, and then you say I am. What that's doing is actually, that's bringing you back into center. So if life is really tough at the moment, which sometimes it is, the, you can still have the inner peace. You can still have something on the inside that is, is central, and that is, I believe, bringing you back to the core, bringing you back to the I am, the God inside you, the connection with everything. So it's important that you stay central. And the other analogy that came to mind was when you see all these tornadoes on YouTube and the whirlwind and all that, hurricanes, where is the safest place? In the middle of the hurricane, there is no centrifugal force, virtually, like in the center. So my encouragement for this morning is stay centered, stay, bring the I am to right here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you all? Um, first of all, I'd just like to echo what Chris said at the beginning, uh, a massive thank you to uh, everything that's brought on a weekly basis. Um, particularly over the last 20 months, I found it's been um, massively helpful to me. Um, and I think sometimes we underestimate how long it takes to put this stuff together. I mean, obviously, I'm privileged to be part of the the singing team and even just the work that we put in on a Thursday night, you know, we really do value what we do here. Um, and I hope that you really do benefit and get something from it as much as we do anyway. So yeah, thank you very much for everything that you bring on a weekly basis. Um, the, um, I don't know whether the slide's up. The um, one that's really stood out to me over the last four weeks was um, the talk about what's the matter with matter. I don't know whether any of you can remember that one being brought. Um, <clears throat> It's something that I could genuinely talk about for hours, but I, I messaged mum and uh, she said, uh, five minutes, I went 10, she put 7.5. So I'll do my best, I promise I'll do my best to fit it in in that time. <laughs> um, so uh, over, I'm, I'm probably gonna stick to, to reading the majority of it because then it means that you'll, you'll get kind of the gist of what it is I wanna, I wanna give. Um, so over the last 17 years here at Q, and it was previously The Rock, you could say that the main focus of our journey has been the deconstruction of matter and the revelation that so much of our trust and faith was in a set of doctrines housed by a particular physical structure. Our security lied in the so-called certainty of a particular set of creeds, the church, the Bible, the sinner's prayer, the breaking of bread. All bricks which served to create what Rob Bell called brickianity. Now, I don't remember we talked about that a lot. Um, Christianity versus brickianity. <clears throat> We devoutly gave our lives to keeping the bricks in their assigned space as to not create a demolition. Our loyalty was to the establishment rather than the truth. As you will be aware, once one brick is challenged and removed, it doesn't take very long before the whole thing starts to topple. I feel quite emotional today, actually, because I think... Um, it's quite fascinating. I remember when all this started 17 years ago, and I remember thinking, I'm quite terrified actually, because now we've started this, what does this really entail? And I'm grateful for it, but at the same time, sometimes I feel a bit exhausted because it's been such a marathon and such a roller coaster. But at the same time, I look at how liberated we've become and think, yes, it's been hard, but the moment you take that brick out, it starts to fall. Over the last 20 months, having much time to reflect on things, it has made me so aware that humans as a species still long for this type of matter. Now, when I talk about matter, we're not just referring to religion. We're talking about everything. We're talking about anything that needs to be built as a way to create security and certainty. I was recently listening to an incredible interview from a psychologist from Belgium. So much of what he said resonated with me and helped me understand what we have, why we witness this phenomenon throughout the ages. He talked about four conditions that need to be met in order for a certain structure and matter to need to be created. One was a lack of social bond. Number two was a lack of meaning. Number three was a feeling of anxiety. And number four was a feeling of frustration. 
When someone tells us the object of our problems, but at the same time offers us a solution to those problems, the institution, matter, is created. Does that make sense to you? So we feel a problem, someone tells you why you feel that problem, they offer you a solution to that problem, therefore we create the matter to house how we can fix that problem. Does that make sense? So let's just use the church. I'm going to use the church and religion as an example because it's quite helpful to us because that's the journey that we've walked. The church tells you the cause of the previous four points is because you are a sinner. You have fallen short of God's glory. So what's the solution? Say the sinner's prayer, follow the Bible, come to church, pray sets of prayer, tick certain boxes, do as you're told, etc., etc. tithe, all those different things. If you uphold this certain set of dogmas, you will get certain things that will alleviate those feelings that you have. What happens is, as meaning and matter emerges, unity forms over a collective ideology that relieves us of this angst. This is where the common enemy concept often comes in. If you notice, many institutions have to have a common enemy and a problem to actually unite. Once that common enemy is dissolved, you could say that there's no longer a reason for that particular thing to exist. And that's another wrestle that we've had here. If there's no common enemy, what do we unite over? Well, we do unite over something. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so, and one of the things, just to mention here, um, the devil was a big thing. We're mad at the devil, we're going to stomp on his face and all that sort of stuff. You know, there was a... Well, there was a dark force that was against us. The reason you feel bad is because the devil is out to get you. Therefore, we'll fight against that enemy. It, or as well, sorry, at this point, another enemy was the others that weren't on the inside of the church that threatened somehow our salvation. I mean, I always found that quite mad as well. It doesn't matter if the matter that is created is completely absurd or even harmful. An example of when matter is completely absurd can be seen in the story of the children of Israel in their exodus. After they were freed from slavery in Egypt, they asked, why have you, why have you brought us into this desert to die? Their slavery actually alleviated their anxiety because they found more meaning in providing the bricks for Pharaoh's palace than they did walking the journey to the promised land. They were actually building their own prison and left totally unaware of what was going on. I don't know whether any of you, I love history, but there's a story of the witch hunts in Switzerland way back in 1429. And when you look at what happened, it's quite fascinating. There was famine, there was disease, there was poverty, there was so much political unrest, there was so much going on. And the establishment at the time convinced the people the reason why this is happening is because of witches, dark forces, which happened to be women. And did you know at one point there was hardly any women left in Switzerland because they were all killed? Think about that. They were convinced the object of your anxiety is witches creating famine and whatever, so they all united over a common belief, which was absolutely absurd, right? But they went about and then acted in a completely crazy way that ultimately caused so much destruction and pain. What, sorry, <clears throat> Um, so what is the matter with matter? It never provides wholeness and true liberty. It diminishes the individual to a set of collective ideas, creating them and us, gay, straight, labor conservative, black, white, I could go on for hours. Let's take these for example, Black Lives Matter, COVID, LGBTQ, feminism, veganism, you could say all in their individual right might not be a problem, but they all become sacred cows. The root of our anxiety and issue is never truly dealt with, and we become totally absorbed in the collective dogma. So let me just link this back to something now. We've looked a lot at um, the story of Eden, Eden and Adam and Eve. The whole point of this story was about oneness with God. Again, Ant said this before. I'm not bothered whether it was 6,000 years ago and about how the world was created. It's what the story behind the story is actually trying to tell you. The job, um, there was no separation in Eden whatsoever. Their job was to simply be and reproduce this throughout the earth. When they ate of the tree, they all of a sudden, what? Saw that they were naked and hid because what? They were afraid. So what had changed? God said to them, who told you that you were naked? Going back to what I just said, 
Who told you that this was the object of your anxiety? I'm just going to tie this up. I hope this is making sense anyway. They had believed that their object of anxiety was, that, that was their nakedness, when in fact the object of their anxiety was the lie that there was separation. So what happens? They use matter, leaves to cover their nakedness when the whole thing is based on an absolute lie. We have been wrestling this since, with this since the dawn of time. More than ever, I find the story of Jesus to be utterly mind-blowing. I was talking to Ruth about this before. Jesus now, I went through a period where I didn't really understand it all. And I think sometimes this happens. Give yourself time. Sometimes when you ask all these questions, you can sometimes throw the baby out with the bathwater. But then over time, you realize where everything fits properly. The whole process of Jesus' teaching was to move people away from matter and remind people of the inward journey to wholeness and oneness with the Father. He reminded them that their object of anxiety wasn't because they were worthless, filthy sinners in need of an institution to save them. He reminded them that their anxiety was created because they had forgotten who they truly were. Love yourself as I have loved you. Love your neighbor. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. We are all one. Do you hear the vibe here? Anything that becomes dogma and requires a common enemy is not your friend. If there's anything to learn from anything that goes on in life, and I won't be overly specific, if they are telling you to, that someone else is an enemy, just be willing to open your mind and question the narrative. That's all I'm saying. After Jesus' death, after Jesus' death, what happened in Scripture, reading what Paul said, he was begging people to not make Jesus another idol. That was the wrestle. So how do we avoid the trap of creating more matter? The easiest option when facing challenges is to revert back to our tendencies to start collective building again. Our internal quest for belonging and meaning can never be cured externally. This is what Dave was saying before. It has to be an internal process. We remain humble that we could always be wrong. We create, create an environment of allowing meaning. We remain fluid rather than static. You can never spiritually grow whilst ever you are bound by this matter. And I found this amazing story. Actually, I don't know whether you've met Hannah. She sometimes comes on a Sunday. Hannah, I'd just like to shout out to Hannah. We chatted a lot about this this week, and she was really helpful in putting it together. Uh, could you just put that other slide on? No state, no church, no vested interest has ever wanted people to have strong souls because a person with a strong spiritual energy will inevitably, inevitably be a rebel, right? And we've said here at Q, uh, you know, the heretic is always wanted to be sought out and killed because we're a threat because what we're saying is we care more about the uniqueness of the individual bringing that as part of the collective than the dogma, um, if that makes sense. <clears throat> This is why Paul said to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The process of transformation comes when we truly become aware of who we truly are as a human being. That love and connection with the source, we call it God, is the very essence of our being. We go back to Eden. The collective should only ever be a celebration of our individuality and this reality. Um, just the last little thing like what I've just said there. Be careful that your need to protect this matter your biological matter at all cost leaves you so bound that you forget what it means to truly be alive. All men die, but not all, all men truly live. Um, that's just a little closing point. Um, and just to finish, I feel totally privileged to be on this journey with you all, um, on this journey of awakening, and feel totally enriched as a human for doing so. Thank you, Q, and thank you all for walking it with me. Thanks. Hi, um, oh, I chose that video, um, so thank you, Chris, um, from the Halloween. Um, I've got my glasses on today because I've got a bit of paper, so I'm not used to having them. Um, so basically, my, the mask I chose, um, sorry, that's better, isn't it, um, was not the same as Chris. It was the mask of serenity that was described on there. Um, and I felt that I was trying to, I've been trying to avoid conflict and uh, wearing that mask, I've not been really wanted to be who I really am um, or saying what I really think um, and it's been a form of self-protection against rejection. Um, I kind of felt the real me wasn't good enough and I kind of wanted to be who people wanted me to be because I wanted to be accepted. Um, 
sort of over, over my life, probably the last few years particularly, I felt that sense of self-worth and who I really am has been getting stronger um, and stronger. And I feel like I've got to a point where I, I can't, uh, the same way I accept things that have before, like maybe somebody who's always talked to me a certain way, treated me a certain way, it, it doesn't sit right anymore. I've got to a certain point with it, really. Um, and I feel like... Um, I've written this down because it was a thought I had that a desire to be who I really am is becoming greater than my need to be accepted. Um, and because that, that need to be accepted is like an ego need, and I, that's very, I feel that's the strength of that. But I do honestly have such a passion to connect with who I really am, and I just want that for me and for everybody, and that is becoming stronger, and I kind of feel like those scales are tipping. Um, um, so... I had um, a particular encounter recently, which was really difficult, and I felt like I had to take that mask off in a more, maybe more than I have before. I had to just explain to someone how I was really feeling, how they were making me feel, and I didn't really think, that, you know, that I, I could just sort of accept that without explaining what what was going on with me. And it was difficult for me, and it was difficult for the other person. They didn't. Think they, they didn't really know that I'd felt like that. But um, so I felt it, was, it wasn't an argument. I felt it was done in an assertive, um, caring way, but it was a difficult, difficult encounter. Um, but um, I don't regret it. Um, I just feel like it steps in the right direction. And when I came to the Halloween meeting and saw the video Chris had done, I thought, oh, that's, that's really what I've been doing there, taking off that, that mask of serenity, where trying to avoid conflict, but I'm at a point where sometimes conflict is necessary, really. I feel like, in a way, now just um, here, being upon this stage, I'm taking the mask off because my, my real, who I really am, wants to be here, I want to share, because this is such, so I'm so passionate about this, what I'm talking about, and I want to share it, I want other people to hear it, but, the, um, the bit of me that's the ego bit wants to sit in the corner with um, my mask on. That's, so there's like two parts going on. And so, you know, we take the mask off and we put it back on again. Um, so I've been doing that for years, I think, taking it off a bit, putting it back on. And, um, and I think that, that's, that's just the way that we grow. Because I, I do feel that real growth is, is a gradual thing. I don't, I'm not saying to people, if you recognize you've got a mask on, to rip it off all of a sudden. I just think that we take, um, take steps, small incremental steps with it. Um, I don't know if some people here might remember a song we used to sing years ago. And I used to love it. it was where, I think it was on where the kids ran up and down the aisles. And it was... I walk by faith, the steps I take are on stepping stones of truth. And there's another line, um, why take a leap when you can walk on the stepping stones of truth? And um, I just feel that, that step, the stepping stones, are um, that's, what, that's the way forward, that's growth. It's, and um, I think like every st step you take is, I know this might sound like a contradiction, but the enormity of a small step because... Like, I think if someone just suddenly recognizes, oh, I have been wearing a mask, and that is a, an enormous small step, and then every time you realize you've taken it off, maybe for a few seconds or whatever, you celebrate that step, it's a small step, and many, many small steps, steps have made a long, a long distance. Um, there's, there's just something that I just thought I'd mention because it's just a way of showing the small steps. Um, something I do on a night before I go to bed, I, um, I always think of the day and with the intention of um, trying to choose the best thing that happened that day. And some days, like if they've been great, it's like if they're all the best things are coming into your mind and they're like fighting for I want to be the best one, I want to be the best one. But then there's some days when I think, gosh, how do I find the best thing? Because... Um, but I always, I always find something, and it could be just a little thought or something I just did a little bit differently or a way I responded a bit differently. And I think, actually, wow, that was amazing. And then that little thing suddenly becomes wow. And then I might think of another one. And then that day suddenly becomes, looks very different. Um, so, yeah, I just thought I'd put that in because it was just like a way of like taking, taking little steps and how they over time make a, a really big difference. Um, 
So, uh, and I just, I just thought I'd also mention as well, um, I've had a lot of freedom for realizing that I don't have to wait for another person to change, for my life to change. Like, the power is in us, and, um, you know, another, the other person, somebody else might change, but it's nothing to do with me. And I, I kind of see, like, if you look at a relationship, like, as a, a whole thing like that, but if I change, like, half of it, the half that's me, effectively that whole relationship has changed because half of it has changed because the whole thing, the interactions, everything is going to be different. And I do, I do think, actually, the way you interact with people, if you... If you change in positive ways I think the way people respond to you will be different anyway but that's not my focus that's it's all about the powers in us and um, you know like just everything Anth was saying last week about our center that's that's where the power comes from and um, and I just I just want to encourage people to just every step you it might be to do with taking off a mask but every step just celebrate every step every small step and just take stepping stones um of, of truth basically yeah and out of the who you really are inside so i think that's me done <laughs> um good morning um, I really enjoyed, especially the week that was about the winds of change, um, because change is something that is very challenging. And the film, Chocola, is, is brilliant. It's, it's genuinely an amazing film. And what we learned about it is that, obviously, there are people in a town like us where they have their, their ways, their safety, and then in blows change. And don't you find often that that change often comes in the face of a person in your life um, and in it blows and then you have to deal with what that brings to everything that you you liked knowing what was expected of you and what you could do and change um, is an absolute incredible revealer of that which we hold really dear and that which we don't want to be questioned and it also comes with like the ashes that she carries with her the mother of her the the, the ashes of her uh, deceased mum and change always comes for me with what we've lost and what we fear we're going to to lose we somehow start to cling tighter to the things that were and when Anth was talking about it he talked about the wind of animos versus the wind of pneuma and whether you see the wind in life as something that brings animosity or whether you see it as opportunity um and I had to acknowledge I see it as animosity a lot of the time. That's my first go-to. And particularly when Anth was uh, talking about this message, I was expect experiencing something really difficult. And often when you experience something that's difficult and then the challenge comes to change, that you do feel animosity because you think, no, I don't want to do it like that. And the, the, there's two choices, I think, sometimes when the animosity comes, isn't there? We, we hear about the fight or flight. But what we heard in that week and spoke about was this other option to sort of sit with it. And he talked about um, how Jesus slept in the boat in the storm. Now, it's a bit like the Noah's Ark story, lovely story. But when you look behind it, it's not so great. Because if you are in your life are in a really scary, terrifying situation and you're trying to be heard and the person you're trying to be heard by is asleep, that feels really unkind and rude and insensitive and you actually feel invisible in those situations you actually feel ignored and invisible and that is the reality of how those things feel when they are the matter in our life but if we take the principle that actually in that moment there was a disconnect between how they were interpreting the storm and actually how Jesus was interpreting the storm, it actually gives me a perspective that says, right, some of the animosity I feel in the storming of my life is, is because of the conclusion I am reaching. And the quote that, I mean, when I said, uh, you know, that they'd said to Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? And he said, no, he didn't because they weren't. <laughs> I just thought, <laughs> that's hard because you think, don't you care? Don't you care? And when someone goes, well, no, I don't, because I don't see it like that. that. They're the things in life that are actually incredibly challenging and create the animosity that we feel. But the truth was they actually had what they needed on that boat, but they didn't know it yet. They couldn't see yet because they didn't know him well enough. They didn't know one another well enough, and they didn't know themselves well enough to know that there was actually a different way to see the storm that we were, they were in. 
And it made me think this week of, um, there's a psychologist called Bruce Tuckman who made something called the Tuckman model, and it, it's, it's knocking around. It's actually used for sort of businessy type development, but I've paraphrased it because I can, <laughs> because it made me think more broadly about the seasons. And these are the four seasons that he talks about forming in the beginning, unsure of purpose, how things fit in, and whether it will work, anxious, curious, or excited, looking for direction, the getting to know stage of life when something is beginning to take shape. Then after that bit when it begins to take shape, inevitably you actually go after that bit to storming. Because you were quite happy with what was coming together and then it goes into storming where you start pushing against established boundaries. Conflict or friction arises because having all sort of come together to form something, Everyone's true character starts leaking out, their preferred ways of working start coming to the surface, and there's tension and clashes. It's like, this was a good idea when we set off, now I don't like it. Um, questioning things that once had authority and indeed the very purpose itself. Lack of clarity about who does what, who says what, what roles have we all got to play here, and it can lead to often two things, either overwhelm for some, because they're like, I haven't got a clue what this is, and for fr absolute frustration for others, we'll be like, will you get a clue about what this is so that we can get on with it? Now, the third stage is norming, where very gradually resolution starts to happen, appreciation for one another, recognition of where there's leadership quality coming to the fore to help the group, effective two-way communication, shared goals and forward momentum. So after the storming, you start to find a way through. Then it goes to performing, which I know has connotations, but go with me, because actually attached to performing, you'll recognize these words, flow, full potential, fluid, we've heard that already tonight, able to adapt, embracing differences and change as we know that differences make things better and so does change. And then later he added a fifth stage that's called adjourning, which is known as mourning, to mark the end of this bit of the journey. And actually he says these are when the permanent things that once were are disbanded and redeployed and that for those who love Wherever it is you've arrived at, that can be the bit that's most difficult. And I just thought for me, they were really interesting sort of a cycle of the, the seasons that we can go through in life. And that's why when we're storming and raging and feeling the animosity that this is a big deal, um, actually, that's only part of a season that you're in. The storming is actually you have to go through that bit to get to any kind of sense in which that can become a flow and something fluid in your life that you're able to embrace. But the answer is not to shut the door to the wind in the first place. Because if when the wind starts blowing, our only reaction is to say, no, not having that. We're never going to go through the different seasons and get a different result. The only, this is the other thing that Ant said. The only thing you can button down is that the wind exists. It cannot be controlled or manipulated to comfort our religious needs. Oh. Um, and if we are in storming, we can't make it a performance of our faith or anything else. And prayer was never about changing God's mind, but always about a mindful consciousness that changes our own. And so our approach to this stuff has to be about me and us being able to say, I'm not going to try and change God's mind about this or anyone else's mind about this. I'm just going to work on me. And we've again heard that already tonight. So at the end of the film, she has to deal with the loss of the ashes of her previous experience. And she has to let those ashes be taken away by the wind um, and not stored in a jar. And our jars can be very, very full of all of the things that we carry around with us, and that's what makes it heavy. But if we could just empty out some of that, we'd have a bit of an empty pot to new put some new things in. And I wanted to end with that um, song, That's Life, after I'd spoken. Because it was, la we only sang it last week, but it was so brilliant, because actually it's a great antidote to remember that there are seasons in life, and in each of those seasons, we've all been different versions of ourselves and then we've gone and done the next bit of life and found something else and actually the key thing is that when we get to the different bits of life 
Um, we then have to pick ourselves up and get back in the race, it says. And I thought, well, what does that mean to get back in the race? And I thought, actually, that's come to mean for me that I have to get back to I am. I have to race, you think of striving, but it's actually the opposite. To get back in the race isn't to get back into doing everything you were doing. Think, right, I'm going to get busy. It's actually to go, no, I am. Get back to center, as we heard at the start. Um, and that's how you get back in the race, to stripping it all back, to being like, I'm going to go back to I am. I'm going to embrace the change in my life, and I'm going to let the wind blow where it blows. <laughs> anyway, that's me. Thank you. Thank you.